I've got to take a, go a little bit further again with the, what I've been talking about recently about the tradition, how tradition can stop us from going where God wants us to go. And for a little while there, I thought that I was just going to be blessed because Nancy, I thought she'd left the house, but she's back. But I want to talk a little bit about how we can be affected by our tradition. And when uh, Nancy uh, got born again, or when she first started to go to church as a little girl, she went to a Methodist church, and uh, Nancy signed the pledge that alcohol would not leave, leave her, touch her lips, and blah blah blah, and all that sort of stuff. And so, when she gets, uh, you know, when we get on further and we get married and a few things like that, Nancy had an inbuilt hatred for alcohol, and uh, I've got that too. <laughs> That because I was brought up in, in an uh, alcoholic home and saw the tragedy, saw what it can do for us. And because of that, uh, there's certain tradition that got built into Nancy's life. And of course, then anybody that had a drink or anything like that, it was like sin. But you see, the Bible doesn't talk about that. It doesn't say that. And I'm saying this very, very early in the message because I want you to forget everything that I've said by the end of the day, amen. Because I'm not trying to serve, give license for alcohol. I'm not trying to do that. But what I'm trying to just build something there that we can understand that we sometimes in our mind and in our imagination, we've built up this stuff that's tradition so that when we come across somebody that perhaps uh, does have a drink or whatever they do like that, we sort of judge them and we, we sort of shun them or, or, or we think that there's something wrong with them or there's something like that. The Bible doesn't say that. What the Bible says is don't get drunk. We've got alcohol today, whiskey, and we've got, what do you call it, uh, vodka and things like that blow your head off. And, and, it's a, and it's terrible stuff. But that's not the way the Bible speaks. And I'm just trying to establish something here because we can build a, a sort of in our minds tradition that, that we've got a wrong opinion. As for me and my house, I don't drink. I just, if you have a drink, God bless you. That's your privilege. What I'm saying to you is don't get drunk. The Bible says be filled with the Spirit and not with grog. <laughs> but anyhow, that's what the Bible says. And so we come to a place here in our lives now where God, I believe, is trying to speak to the church. Because if, if this morning, if I went around one after the other and talked about different things, end times, uh, all this stuff, remarriage, goodness knows what, we would have so many different opinions. And those opinions not, not, aren't necessarily right. But there are things that have been put into us by by the teachings, by things that we've heard, uh, different, different other opinions that have built inside us. But I believe that God wants to set us free. He wants to help us to come and, and understand exactly what He says. I would imagine, sir, with your upbringing, you have great difficulty with alcohol and things like that because it's been built inside us. You've just got to go into the hospitals and see the amount of tragedy that's caused through those sort of things and to, to build up in yourself a, 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 an attitude. But there's also another area that we can sort of talk about all day and argue about if we wanted to. But what God does want us to do is He wants to know the truth, and the truth makes you free. And He wants us to be led by the Spirit. He wants to, us to be able to be led by the Spirit. And being led by the Spirit is not always easy. It's not always easy. We, we think it's easy, but... But it's not. The Bible says, he who has an ear in Revelation 3.22, uh, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. It's not easy because when God speaks, it sometimes and many times cuts across our belief system or our tradition or our doctrine. I'd like to go back to a few things that I've skimmed over uh, last week. I believe the Holy Spirit is at work doing the things, doing great things. I believe He's awesome what He's doing. Doing things that we may not be fully aware of even. Things that, that, that we don't know. 
I can remember one time in, in a meeting, and I was I must really mentioned this before, but but I say it again that I was I was the pastor of the church and I was there and I was a bit concerned saying, God, why don't we why why isn't this happening? Why isn't that happening? A little bit like what we've heard this morning, you know, about the 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 this uh, uh, the curtain that we haven't broken through yet and and that's the questions that, that are in our hearts. Why don't we see this healed? And why don't we see that? And why don't we all these sort of things? And, and, but, you know, the, the Spirit of God, as, he, as he, he spoke to me this day and he said, Neil, he said, you would be amazed at what I'm actually doing out there. And, and what we've got to do, this is a confidence that we have to have that Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. But he also said this, he said, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. I'm going to give you keys. I'm going to give you ways. I'm going to, I'm going to show you. I'm going to reveal stuff to you that will open things up. But what happens is when God starts speaking to us and starts sharing with us to do certain things, we are usually the one that says no. We're the one that, that stops the Spirit of God from moving. David was saying there today that as a 12-year-old boy that, that God was speaking to him. God was speaking to him. You've got you to comprehend this. God was speaking to a 12-year-old lad about water baptism and his need for water baptism. I remember the time as a 27-year-old man when God was speaking to me about water baptism. You must surely remember times when God was speaking to you. But when He starts to speak to you, usually it cuts across what you think. Because you see, I was sprinkled as a child and I didn't need it. But I did need it, but God was trying. But see, my tradition and the, the way that's been built inside you wars against what the Spirit of God wants to say to you. What I'm just trying to say we've got to be careful that where we dig our toes in. Because God wants to do something for you. And I'm just wondering today if, if David, if he hadn't known, if, if, if as, even as a 12-year-old lad, if he would have said no, 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 if he would have allowed fear to, to rob him from going ahead. You see, David ended up becoming an assistant pastor in the church. Today he's over in, in Vancouver uh, doing his thing over there. A professor in a... In a university, amen. But you see, if, if, if we don't, as a 12-year-old boy, if he would have said no, and if he would have dug his toes in and would have said, I, I don't, blah, 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 whatever it might have been, you see, you never take the next step. And what I'm saying is the next step is always starts with a yes. The next step is always, yes, Lord, have your way in me. Yes, Lord, and that's where God takes us. And what I'm so fully aware of today is that we sometimes say, God, why haven't you done this? Why don't we see this? Why don't we see that? It's because the church has been so programmed to say no. Mm. Our doctrines and our traditions speak to us many times louder than the Spirit of God Himself. And we're bound by our traditions, and our traditions and our things bring the Word of God to no effect. I've been sharing a little bit about Cornelius and Peter. And this is an amazing story here uh, about these, these two guys. Amazing story. It's found in Acts chapter 10, verse 1. It says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. He was one of Joe's guys. He was a devout man, and one who feared God with all his household and gave alms generously to the people and prayed. You know, sometimes, friends, our lack of being able to give stops the hand of God. God doesn't want your money, but in this situation, He says, your prayers and your arms have gone up, or your prayers and your giving, 
or your prayers and your generosity. Your prayers and, and what you've done has gone up before me. And God wanted to touch him. And we know this story only too well. And, 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 and God starts to speak to this man. At any time, this man could have said, God, what have you been on? Don't you realize that you're asking me to send my people to Jewish people who it's unlawful for them. They say that we are unclean. They, they aren't, won't even touch us. They won't even shake our hands. They won't eat with us. They won't do anything with us. And you're asking me to send my men to this place, this guy by the name of Peter, and you're going to ask, you're going to have to ask him to come. How stupid can that be? Friend, I want to tell you sometimes the things that God asks you to do are foolishness to your natural mind. Sometimes, I'm going to say this a few times today, sometimes you may not have, uh, you might only have $100 and God says, give it. Your natural mind says, I can't. And then if you don't, you just, you just go on and that's it. You go through life, but you don't understand. But I've heard so many testimonies. and I'm not, I'm not asking you to give your last hundred dollars. I'm not asking you to sell your house. I'm not asking you to do anything like that. All I'm asking you to do is listen to what God's saying and do what He says. Don't do it because somebody else did it. But I've heard hundreds of times, many, many times, of people that have been in that situation and have done what God said to them to do. And with another, within 24 hours, God has just given them back a hundredfold and broken the curse and broken it and smashed through something. Friend, I'm talking about if we really want the hand of God, if we want God to do things in our lives, we've got to be obedient and we've got to know that God before us who can be against us, He's not going to take your money so you go poor. He wants to do whatever He can do for you because He loves you. And here is, here is this Cornelius but I want to tell you, the Spirit of God is moving. And right from the very beginning of time, the Holy Spirit was hovering over this earth, hovering over it, waiting for God. And when God spoke and said, let there be, the Holy Ghost came in and did exactly what God says. And here is this man, Cornelius, and he's praying there. But at the same time, the same time, Peter, who goes to a person's house and is very, very hungry, very, very hungry, and God starts to deal with Peter. Friend, we have got no idea in the natural what God is doing in the realm of the Spirit. I've got no idea, but I know, if I know anything about God, I want to tell you this, I have total confidence that God is dealing and talking and ministering to you. Now, whether you're saying yes, that's another story. And here's Peter, hungry, and he's up there, and he starts to, and he starts to pray, and he goes into a trance. And God starts doing things with him, and God starts showing him unclean things. Peter's first reaction is, no, 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 by the hair of my chinny, chin, chin, I will not let that in. Anybody catching what I'm, where I'm going here? Shut your eyes. Is that you too? <laughs> Man, I, I've said no more than I've ever said yes. Praise God I've said a lot of yeses. Amen. God keeps tapping, keeps hitting, keeps, keeps touching us, keeps ministering to us. And here, here is... Peter there, and he brings down this sheet with all this stuff. And he said, no, 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 no. I want you to go to this place. Oh, God, I have never, ever done anything like this. I have never eaten in a, in a Gentile's house. I have never touched things that are unclean. I have never, never, never. And you see, we read the story now, and that story, as it unfolds, we know there that Peter was obedient. And he said, okay, Lord, I'm going to put my trust in you. I don't understand it. I know I'm going to get in trouble with all the religious people. 
I stand on chairs and I jump and I shout and I spit and, and I get in trouble with the religious people. <laughs> oh, he shouldn't be standing on chairs at his age. I get up there sometimes and I don't know how to get down. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm saying here is this, and I pray that you can catch this. God had a purpose, and God had a plan, and that was to expose and bring the Gentile church under the banner, under the unction, under the, under the salvation of Jesus Christ. That was his plan. But God uses man, and man can say no to God anytime he likes. And what happened here, it, what could have happened here is Peter could have said, I'm not going with those boys. It's unlawful for me to do that. His tradition said it was, but was it unlawful? No, it wasn't. It was the law that Jesus came and set Peter free from. But the law was still now yelling at Peter, saying it is unlawful for you to do this. And Peter at that point of time could have said, no, I am not going. That is, I am a good Jewish man. And that's it, finished. But I thank God that the Holy Ghost is greater. Amen? And if we, if friend, I want to tell you this. I don't know if... if all I know is that as, as Peter began to pray, as the Spirit of God come upon him, friend, can I say this? In the moments that we come into this church and we've got time and place, I give the Holy Ghost full reign in this place. But because I know, I know that as the musicians play and as you sing and as you begin to worship and as you begin to open up your heart and as you begin to lift your, your whatever it might be to God, that the Spirit of God can come down in a mighty way and He can mess with your theology and He can mess with your tradition and He can mess with you, amen. And He can do things that, that will set you free because that is all that God wants to do. He doesn't want to bind you again. He he wants to loose you. He wants to release you. He wants to set you free. Hallelujah. Oh, I tell you what, friend, I believe. I don't care how young you are or how old you are. I believe that people are going to start standing up and shouting their heads off in this place. Don't let your tradition say, I've just got to sit here. I want to tell you, unglue your saddle, glory to God, and let the power of God touch you, and let the anointing of God get inside you, and have a shout, and have a roar, and whatever. Do for Jesus, amen. Come on, have a, about to have a shout right now. Come on, have a roar right now. Why don't you stand up, every? Go ahead, show, show. <laughs> Some of you still got glue in your saddle. <laughs> we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Tradition will stop us and bind us and smash us. It will do all the rubbish, I don't know our opinions and that. I want to tell you, friends, our opinions are terrible things. Everybody's got them. I call them like armpits. We've all got armpits and a lot of them stink. Our tradition does the same. We've got to be set free and, 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 and find out what God wants to do. Holy Spirit is always moving. Speaking, bringing about divine connections. Holy Spirit working. you got to picture the scene. He's working on both Cornelius and Peter at the same time, both coming from opposites, opposite areas, opposite whatever you call that. <laughs> what is it? Well, that'll do. <laughs> but he wanted to bring them together. Wanted to bring them together. Neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. But God had a purpose in it. He's got a purpose, and that was to bring, uh, to break the lie of tradition so the Holy Ghost could be poured out on the Gentiles because Peter and and. and the, the rest of the Jews that came with him, the, the, the Jewish Christians that came with him, those people, they saw and they accepted what God had done. 
They saw the move of the Spirit. They saw the hand of God. And I'm skimming over this. Paul was a, was a man. He was so affected by tradition. Philippians 3.5, it says, this is Paul saying who he was. He said, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is, which is in the law, blameless. That's who he was. His tradition was there, his tradition. But he, but he said these words. He said, but now I count these things as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Paul was so caught up in tradition, it stopped him from seeing the Messiah he was looking for. Friend, I want to say it again. It stops us from seeing many times the, the thing that you want to see, the breakthrough in your life. There's only one way you can break through, and that's by saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'm not asking you to be stupid. I'm not asking you just to, to be tossed around by every wind of doctrine. I'm not asking you if somebody come up to you and prophesied over you and told you certain things. If you don't feel a witness in your spirit, if you don't understand, friend, I want to tell you, don't do it. But what I'm saying is, have an ear to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Friend, it's time to be mature. It's not time to just continue to drink milk and, and, and fluff around playing church. It's time to be the church, the church triumphant, the church victorious, ruling and reigning with Christ. That's who we are. We have to learn that identification that my brother was talking about at communion. I identify with Jesus Christ. You've got to identify with Him. It is He, amen. It's He who we serve and who we love. May God build His church as He said He would. We find here that, that Paul was so caught up, it stopped him from seeing the things that we was looking for. We're looking for deliverance. We're looking for freedom, my friend. Don't let your theology stop us. God is always work, working on our behalf and our best interest. How many people believe that? Jono from Sunshine Coast the other day, he put it on his, Nancy read it to me on, his, on Facebook or whatever it was, that they're, they're, try, they're, they're feeding hungry people at Christmas time. They're trying to help people. And somehow or other they ran out of hampers and they needed another 10 hampers. And, you know, I want to tell you, God is a good God. They needed another 10 hampers that they didn't have. And all of a sudden they get a phone call and this guy says, I've got 10 hampers, could you use them? That'll do me, amen. That'll do me. You know what God is doing? God's getting people's attention. God's wanting to say, I can supply all of your need according to your riches in glory. I am not limited by what I can do and what I can make and what I can earn and what I this and what I can do. I am totally committed and believe that God can do exceedingly abundantly above all I could even imagine or think that God wants to do greater things. Greater things than this shall you do. Amen. I believe the first thing we've got to do is open our hearts. Ask God by His Spirit to reveal hindrances and deal with them. I don't know if you know Kevin Connor, but Kevin Connor would most be one of the, the greatest Bible teachers I've ever known. I actually put myself through a Bible school with all of his handbooks. But an amazing man, a man of the Spirit. He, he memorized the whole book of Hebrews because while he's gone through Bible school, he, he uh, drove tractors. So he memorized the whole book of Hebrews. So while he was driving the tractor, he could go over it verse by verse, verse by verse, verse by verse at the book of Hebrews. But you see, he had all this tradition too. I don't care who you are, whether you, you've been to the greatest universities in the world, tradition has got no respect. And old Kevin here with, with all these great teachings and everything like that, and he's trying to work out about when people got slain in the Spirit. He was watching people getting slain. He studied it in the Bible where people got slain in the Spirit. And so he had it all worked out. He said, I know what it is. Where's Chrissy? You, you just block your ears for a little minute. <laughs> but, 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 but he said, okay, 
This is what happens. People who fall backwards, that's God. People who fall forwards, that's the devil. <laughs> God, just hang on. You've got to, got to let me finish. Let me finish. So this was his theory. And he talked this, talked this everywhere, told everybody about this. This is what, if you fall forward, guess what? Not too many people fell forward. Chrissy may never fall forward again. <laughs> <laughs> so one day Kevin and his wife feel to go out for prayer and so out they go and this evangelist or whoever it was prayed for him she fell backwards, he fell forward <laughs> and he turned to someone and said God is the good God <laughs> People ask me, why do people fall over? Because they can't stand up. <laughs> oh, I think I've talked enough. I feel a bit like Joe. <laughs> oh, Jesus. But most moves of the Spirit Throughout history, was stopped by man, by man's opinions, their belief system. Azusa Street revival. Seymour was a, a man that carried a mantle. He was a black man. Had the Holy Ghost all over him. He used to sit on the platform of his church and his pulpit was made of two apple crates with a lid on the top. And he would put his head in that apple crate waiting on God because he said he didn't want to get distracted by what was going on around him. In that time while he had his head in the, in the box, the, the people in the church were praying for people. People were getting out of wheelchairs. Blind eyes were open. Miracles were happening all over the place. And they said after a period of time, when sometimes he might have been in there for 20 minutes, sometimes he might be in there for an hour, might be two hours, all depends. But when the Spirit of God got on him, then he said they, he would get out of that box and he would stand up and he began to speak. And, and they said that there was a Shekinah glory that used to, uh, like a, a mist that used to be on the ground there. And as, as they began to worship and as they began to listen to him preach, that mist would begin to rise. People would be get, getting healed and delivered and set free. But you see, religious people came. Highfalutin people came with the double-breasted suits. With the money, most probably. I don't know. It's one of the reasons that I want to give away every fourth offering in this church to break that thing of mammon. Amen? We're no flush church. I drive a 90 old car. <laughs> but you've got to break things. You've got to break things. Amen? Let God be God. But the triple-breasted suits or whatever they call them, would come in and say, we don't think we could stay in a church like this. This thing he could have said, well, there's one up the road. <laughs> but you see, because somewhere or other inside of every pastor, you want to please people. You want to help people. You don't like to see this and that going on. People upset. So he took his head out of the box. And the Spirit of God left. Most moves of God are stopped by people. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Amazing things. Their opinions. Their belief systems. Logic, most times, seems a better way. Today, in the modern church, we're told 
You shouldn't talk about the blood. You shouldn't talk about blood because it's, it's, awful. it's, uh, it's, it's awful. And people, people get uh, all yucky. People get offended. Friend, if you don't talk about the blood, what are we going to talk about? You've got to be able to talk about the cost. I hear you, Lord. You've got to talk about the cost. There's a whip went into his body, into his flesh, and tore that flesh from his bones as he was so swollen and, and affected by that whip. As they hung him upon that, that rugged cross, as, even as he walked down the streets, as they spat at him and jeered him, as he fell on the ground many, many times into his face, as the weight of that, that, that cross, as he, as he had no protection and his face would have hit the pavement and would have just tore lumps of flesh off until they, they couldn't carry it anymore and they gave it to another man to carry. But as he, as he dragged himself there and as they nailed him to that cross and as that, blood, as that blood oozed from his body, friend, we've got to be able to talk about the blood, amen. Because the blood, the blood will set you free, amen. The blood, the blood, the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, hallelujah. Oh, the precious, precious blood, the blood that can redeem me, the blood that can set me free, hallelujah, the blood that will wash me clean of all my infirmities and all my sicknesses and all of my diseases, hallelujah. Oh, the precious, precious blood. The blood will never the blood will never lose its power. For it cleanses. It washes. I don't know. How's that go? I've got everybody mucked up now. Washes. Blood will never lose its power. All these good ideas. Don't speak in other tongues. I got another one. Don't breathe. <laughs> I say, but if we don't breathe, we die. I want to tell you, if you don't talk about the blood, you die. Amen. If you don't speak in other tongues, you die. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, the blood, the blood, the blood sets the captives free. For it reaches to the highest mountain. It goes to the lowest valley. I don't know about you where he found you, but he found me down in that valley. But my God, he lifted me up. He lifted me up. He lifted me up. And all the joy that floods my soul. He touched me. He touched me. He touched me. Touched me. And he made me whole. We got some musicians in the house. Friend, love Jesus. The blood will never lose its power. He's working on our lives, friends, drawing us to himself. Because he's going to build a great church wants to touch your life. I can't think it's in D. <laughs> well, let's stand. Can I, just before, just before we sing it, hey guys and girls, we're running pretty close to the end of the year. It's a good time to Leave some old junk behind. Find your freedom, liberty. But also, I talked a little bit this morning about a step. Yes. Some of us are so, we just don't need 
to respond to God. I want to tell you, friend, I want to respond to God every day. This doesn't mean anything other than you just want God to touch. You just want God to, to have His way in your life, perhaps. Reveal things, help you. So I believe that God wants to use every person. So while we're singing this song this morning, if you just want to publicly, whatever, I don't know, to say, God, I just want to be your man. I just want to be your woman. I just want to be able to be that person that when you do speak, that I will say yes. That I won't let tradition and I won't let stuff stop me from responding to you. Just while we sing this song, you got it, Jade? He is Lord. Just feel free to come. He is Lord. Let the anointing of God touch your life today. Let the presence of God touch you in a new way. touch some people today and I know that God's talking to you but you might think I I don't know what you're thinking but I want to tell you just let God have his way in your life today allow that fresh wind to blow over your life just respond to him not to kneel just respond to Him and lift up your heart and allow Him to touch you. There's somebody here today and you've got a, a kink in your neck. It goes right down into like your shoulder blade. I believe the Spirit of God would want to touch you today. Across your shoulders, there's another one there across your shoulders and lower part of the higher part of your back rather. Down into your left shoulder even. Just need that touch this morning. You might be here today and you just need that touch. Touch from the Master's hand. Long, long time ago, there was a, an auction. And I remember Morris Hovey, great man of God, used to recite this poem. And the auctioneer was selling this violin. He said, who will give me a dollar? 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 Some worthless piece of equipment. Nobody even wanted to give him a dollar. And an old man walked from the back of the hall. He walked down, he picked up that violin and he started to just play with the things at the end there. Put it to his chin and started to play a melody. I don't know about you, but I am like that old violin that needed a touch from a master's hand. 
You might need that touch from a master's hand today that will stop you from going astray, going into your own, own thing. That'll bring you back to the core, that'll bring you back to the fold, that'll bring you back to the purpose and plan that God has for your life. And as this old man started to play that melody, so sweet and so precious and so beautiful, All of a sudden, who will give me a thousand? And up went a hand. Who will give me two? And another hand. Who will give me three? Who will give me four? Who will do? And what was the value in? They placed that old instrument into a master's hand. Friend, today, you are that instrument that God wants you to place in His hand. Friend, let the Spirit of God touch your life today. I, I don't usually carry on like this. But I believe for some people in this place, it is very, very crucial today that you allow the Spirit of God to touch you. Somebody here with a kidney condition, I believe God wants to touch your life. God wants to touch your life today. You can hear old Morris saying those words. Hear the Spirit of God speak to your life today, friend. Let Him touch your life today. Let Him touch you. Let Him touch you. Holy Spirit. Remember Morris? Remember it well. Let's place it in the master's hand. He'll play a melody in your life. He'll play a melody. He'll play a melody in your life. He wants to play a melody in your life. He is Lord. This may come as a surprise. But the problem is not God. God is not the problem. We just gotta to learn to say yes. 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 Yes.